All right, hello. Today I'm joined by Marcus Furious Pertinex uh, to discuss the war in Ukraine. We're going to discuss a number of angles on this topic that I think is getting insufficient attention, frankly, uh, especially among our sphere of the dissonant right. So stream is live. Looks like we're good. Um, so as I said, I, I feel like this uh, this topic is not getting sufficiently covered. Um I recall during the coronavirus pandemic, um, Morgoth was was frustrated at people not really focusing enough on that topic. And, you know, that's I didn't really I didn't make any videos about it, did I? But uh, so I kind of feel like that about the re Ukraine war to sort of put this in perspective. I think Morgoth was 100 percent right that all of our focus should have been on the the, the virus and the lockdowns when it was happening. Uh, and opposing those things. And I feel the same way about this war. Obviously, the Ukrainian war narrative displaced the coronavirus narrative. And I think that should tell you something that should tell you enough right there about how important this war is to the regime. And I think it's very important for us to um, understand what this war is correctly and why we should oppose our country's participation in this war. Uh, because this war serves... Um, the internationalist uh, regime um, that is running Washington, D.C. and the re Western world right now. Uh, we know that, I mean, our friend Stephen Carson, for example, will understand very well um, that war is how the American empire, uh, so to speak, expands itself. Um, it's not a trivial matter, even if it's some faraway country like Iraq or in this case, Ukraine. Um, this is a big deal. And currently the war that's happening in Ukraine is the big deal to the regime, right? It's literally displaced the coronavirus narrative. And while the war might not be directly affecting you um, as much as the virus uh, and, well, less the virus and more the lockdowns were, obviously, um, we should still put due attention on it um, because this is uh, very significant. So I want to try and, you know, produce some content uh, on this channel um, sort of examining this war and hopefully trying to get people to care more about it from an anti-war stance. Um, you know, I'm very disappointed to see uh, the right insufficiently anti-war uh, in this regard. Um, you know, as our as our friend Thomas Seven Seven quotes from uh, I forget the source, but you know, war comes like the seasons, and so it does. But also, it's a human affair um, that can be dialed up or down. And when war is happening, uh, we should do what we can to see if the war ends. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, our countries are on the wrong side of this conflict. In fact, our countries instigated the conflict in the first place, uh, which is something we'll get into. So now that I've sort of given my intro spiel, uh, Furious, do you have anything you want to say in response? Do you want to introduce yourself, maybe? Uh, you know, whatever. Go ahead. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Charlie. Um, I suppose most people who probably subscribe to Charlie would know who I am and what I do. and Because uh, I, I mostly co-host with... Uh, Apostolic Majesty, who has thankfully made his comeback, but sadly I couldn't join him for his stream yesterday. Um, but yes, I mostly sort of cover things from a historical standpoint. And uh, and I suppose it's worth saying that I, I think that you and myself, Charlie, probably share similar views on this and have probably been similarly disappointed at the fact that many in our sphere haven't quite got the nature of this war in, a, in the Donbass in Ukraine. And many other people have been uh, perhaps duped is, un duped is an unfair term, but have either been duped or have gone along with regime narratives or in a misplaced sort of sense of, of patriotism or parochialism have supported the puppet regime in Kiev, which it essentially is, um, and, uh, and also have overlooked some of the complexities which lie at the face of, of, of this war and... Um, and indeed, as, as you've just referenced, have overlooked the intentional malfeasance which has taken place at the behest of our own elites. Because um, it's very much a case of errant elites sort of going awry and misusing uh, and exploiting our own institutions and our own blood and treasure for what amount to geopolitical games. And that, you know, I, know, I know much is often made of the whole you know is the united states of america the roman republic or is it the roman empire and what does decline look like and how does it manifest and what does a great power do when it's on when it's waning and you know i mean there are many people particularly i think we've heard it uh, occasionally say like by the 
by the gentlemen on the Duran who've sort of made analogies towards, or you know, or when a dying empire or when an empire is dying, rather, it tends to make mistakes. It jumps from adventure to adventure, and um, you know, engages in catastrophic errors until it eventually creates a fatal one. Um, I think we are seeing this, and uh, and, and like you say. Um, about, about the anti-war thing I, I wouldn't say maybe maybe anti-war i'm not sure i i would say that's necessarily my view but what we should definitely issue is bad wars or wars that um are, un, are inherently unjust i think it's right for a country to have a a martial streak to it that it should have a you know a powerful armed forces but it should serve a good um america and the west pouring its its assets into a into a proxy war that instigates a, a, a what has been a um a rival power you know for for the greater part of the last two centuries you know with the exception of the fall of the soviet union in 91 and then russia kind of bringing itself back together in the last 20 years as an exception russia has been a peer power of, of the great powers for several centuries and um the elites in washington and whitehall and other places have a great problem with that and you know we have seen um, you mentioned the coup as well, and we've seen these narratives being, you know, thrown into hyperdrive gear. Um, and it's a bit like the NPC meme, you know, the 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 COVID chip has been, oh well, like the Orange Man bad chip was installed into the NPC brain, and then that was swapped out for the COVID chip, and now the COVID chip has been removed, and they've put in the, you know, the the Russia Putla Ukraine war chip into the NPC meme, <laughs> and um, and here we are. So I hope we can have a fruitful discussion on this point. Yes, and before we really get into it, I really want to pinpoint that the moral dimension here. Um, I want to make this content because my government is responsible for uh, murdering tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of people right now for its own um, base geopolitical interests. And a lot of people put this uh, war in sort of this culture war paradigm or this ideological paradigm. Uh, you know, some wars have to be fought. Um, you know, the war of Northern aggression uh, perhaps didn't need to be fought, but I'm not saying, you know, the, the American South should have just not fought, right? Like sometimes you have to fight a war. Uh, this war should not be fought and my government should stop funding the mass murder of people in, of Slavic peoples on both sides of the war uh, because it's, it's frankly immoral. And I just want to point out, you know, are we Christians or not? Are we right wingers? Uh, are we just individualists now? I mean, obviously you can support the war because yeah, it might, benefit you materially if you're an american to uh, expand the american empire but i'm not for that right i'm 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 interested in what is actually right and what is good and that's this war is not a good war okay it is it is uh it's simply murder being inflicted by the americans and also the anglos we shouldn't leave them out the great britain um it's Indeed. it's just being inflicted upon Ukraine and Russia uh, simply to damage the Russian people and for the Americans to expand NATO forcefully into Ukraine. That's what this is about. And Indeed. I, oppose, I oppose that, this on moral grounds and that, that's really it. Absolutely. Just on that point, I just want to buttress you very quickly that people of our ilk who think as we do, um, you know, and, and, and rightfully possess the cynicism that we do for regime narratives, right? If, if, if someone sits roughly, you know, sort of, proximity in that sort of line of thought if if you find yourself agreeing with you know the likes of um hillary clinton and victoria newland and anthony blinken and you know i mean I, I know john mccain's passed away but you know he actually had a fundamental role in the maidan coup and the you know, the the transformation of ukraine into a, a vassal state essentially um you know when you're agreeing with the bipartisan politics of washington and the state department and the pentagon um and you know the the bulk of the European Union and NATO command, etc., uh, etc. Et um, one should look at themselves in the mirror and think, why is that the case? If I'm agreeing with these people who, who or these creatures who make my life hell and have ruined my nation and every nation of you know of the West, and they're saying go in this direction, and they and I agree with them, is my thought process as sound as I think it is? And I don't think too many people are prepared to do that, frankly. Yes. And, you know, there's a there's a difference between, you know, the Americans pursuing their geopolitical interest in, say, the Western Hemisphere. Uh, you know, like I agree with the Monroe Doctrine in principle, 
Uh, I don't think the United States has any business fighting a war far off in the eastern reaches of Europe um, between the Slavic peoples. Um, so I'm not rejecting the idea that, you know, my nation, as does Russia, that these places have a sphere of influence. Uh, but I certainly don't support, um, you know, fighting this proxy war far outside the, the American sphere of influence. Um, I'm not against, you know, I don't want I don't want the United States to be weak or crumble at the same time. Obviously, we have to oppose the global American empire, as people put it, um, in the hands it's currently in. Uh, this is a this is a difficult problem, right? Uh, um, mm. But I want so I want to try and be nuanced here. And absolutely, and, and indeed, so, more to the so point, for, be, be, when you look at a map, sorry, Charlie, just quickly, just when you look at a map as well, you know, this would be the case of Mexico sort of trying to support, you know. Um, the re in, the reintroduction of say New Mexico or Texas into Mexico, you know, and, and nibbling away at the southern borders of the USA. This is literally a case of um, the United States sort of supporting or, or, or placing what how have I described it? I've 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 said it in in so far as this is the United States and the West attempting to sort of hold the dagger at Russia's you know belly or its flank and trying to press the knife in, and it would be like. It would be equivalent to Russia supporting, you know, a, a breakaway of, you know, like Latin states in the south rejoining Mexico. It's, it's the exact same sort of idea. Um, and, uh, you know, the, there's no introspection as to why the Americans are doing this or the West for that matter. So, you know, it, it, it's important to frame it in a way of you know just how far away from the American sphere of influence is this. And it's like quite literally on Russia's doorstep. To be frank, right. You know, speaking. And, and I'm certainly not, you know, pro Russia or whatever. In fact, you know, this whole Eurasianist thing that you see a lot from some of the right wing, I regard as very dangerous. You know, I'm not a Eurasianist. Uh, the Russians are a different mm -hmm. civilization. Uh, at the same time, uh, yeah. they're also a semi European civilization and at least a Christian one. And in general, I, I simply oppose the hegemony of the united states being used to eradicate other cultures across the world and that is what the united states is trying to do uh to russia right now and i don't want to see the russian civilization annihilated i don't want to see them conquer europe either but that's that's sort mm. of an exaggeration right that people are getting into into this so let's try to actually get into the topic now so one of the big issues is people claim that this is an aggressive war on the part of russia and they have this weird view of Putin uh, and Russia that they're just like these very uh, basic, simple-minded expansionists. And this is simply Russia trying to aggressively expand its territory. I mean, whatever you might think of Vladimir Putin, the guy is obviously not an idiot. He doesn't appear to be the greatest wartime leader, but he's not some simple tin pot dictator trying to expand the Russian sphere of influence. Um, I mean, the way this war... So it should be clear that this war started, first of all, Back in 2014, um, following the color revolution that overthrew overthrew the Ukrainian president uh, Yukashenko, um, who was sort of pro-Russian, right? And he was replaced with Poroshenko, who was more Western-leading. Um, that was uh, the West will accuse uh, you know the Russians of uh, pulling off of, of like instigating uh, in that, even though it doesn't really make any sense because it ended up out ousting their own like. Um, pro-Russian president in Ukraine. Um, so that's how things sort of kicked off. Uh, this led to the secession of Crimea, um, which, you know, people, again, will say that that was like an invalid referendum, which I don't really get because it's it's completely sensible to me. We'll get more into this later as we review this video I want to look at. Um, I don't want to summarize the whole history of the conflict because you can find it elsewhere, but uh, following the Crimean incident, uh, basically separatists in Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, the two two uh, oblasts of uh, Ukraine, and also actually in other parts like Kharkov, uh, I believe Sumy, um, Kherson, and Zaporizhia as well, also saw their, saw their own sort of protest as well. But it was in the Donbass region, as we call it, that uh, a sort of militia movement actually succeeded in resisting the Ukrainian military for uh, several months before Rush Russia finally started sending military aid. Uh, so this is really a civil war uh, that the Americans got involved in and the Russians ended up getting involved in. Um, it started by uh, the quote-unquote Russians 
living in Ukraine, and this, this sort of gets weird talking about, but there, there are people in Ukraine who regard themselves as Russians, and it was those people um, who uh, basically attempted to secede from the Ukrainian government um, for a number of reasons. I mean, one of the reasons were the laws uh, that the Ukrainians were passing against the use of the Russian language in these places. Um, you know, <laughs> this is a huge area of the world. Uh, everyone's done something bad to everybody, basically. Uh, but the fact of the matter is these regions attempted to secede, and effectively they did because the Ukrainian military um, was unable to prevent them from doing so. Uh, and, and the issue here is that rather than... So th there was basically a peace negotiated between um, the separatist regions and uh, Ukraine proper uh, with the assistance of Russia and Germany, uh, and France, and a uh, third country in Europe at least. Uh, but this resulted in the signing of what's called the Minsk Agreements, which was a ceasefire that was designed basically to de-escalate the situation and give the two Donbass republics the concessions they wanted in terms of autonomy. Um, unfortunately, and there was a second round of agreements too. Uh, there was Minsk, Minsk 1 and Minsk 2. Unfortunately, as we know now, these were conducted in bad faith as the Ukrainian uh, former President Poroshenko and former German Chancellor Angela Merkel have made clear. They've literally said that these uh, this treaty basically was conducted in bad faith to buy time for Ukraine to build up a military uh, sufficient enough to invade the Donbass, right? So Ukraine was planning to attack these two separatist regions uh, for, for eight years and then actually proceeded to do so. Um, this really gets lost in the history of the war. Um, but let me go ahead and find a screen share here what is it present present perhaps share a screen Entire... in, indeed just just while you're sorting that out charlie i will i yeah. will watch your point by saying that this is definitely something that is missed and let's face it the regime does it intentionally this is an accidental right that the idea that this war just broke out spontaneously in february 2022 for no reason whatsoever is a fiction there has been you know skirmishes all along the what were what were the old battle lines in luhansk and donetsk i mean for instance um i believe the the rebels actually had um hold of parts of mariupol for for several months and then you know it was those so-called nationalist battalions that moved in and actually crushed um their uprising up in mariupol and in partook in in um or shall I say, you know, like revenge attacks on those who, who did that. And there have been artillery changes between the the Donbass militias and the what were a more nascent Ukrainian army back in 2014, 2015. And, uh, you know, this is completely lost in the wash. And people who are less informed on this subject can say what we are and those of our peers um, don't know any better. And that's a tragedy because, you know, the, the context of this war actually matters a lot, whether it's the... You know, whether it's the Ukrainian army mobilizing against the Donbass, whether it's Minsk, whether it's the admissions, like you say, by Angela Merkel and some of the EU big shots as to the, you know, the fact that they um, conceived of Minsk on purpose to buy time to arm Ukraine. You know, there's been a lot of, um, you know, malfeasance and misgivings, uh, misgivings and deceit in regards to this war. And yet the West considers itself considers itself without sin certainly it's elites do and they're selling their people what is a nonsense and and essentially a lie right and the, the these minsk agreements the fact that they were conducted in bad faith by the west is a big deal that needs to be highlighted because effectively what you've done is you've destroyed international diplomacy which basically only leaves war i mean how is russia supposed to negotiate an end to this war with the West when the West acts in bad faith. And again, I'm saying the West. Correct. Okay. I know yeah. I understand like Ukrainian nationalists might want to focus more on Ukraine, but let's be honest, Ukraine could not Ukraine would have lost this war already if it were not for the Western aid. The Ukrainian the Ukrainian military was was built up with the assistance of NATO uh, in the first place. And the the continuation of the war is entirely dependent on NATO at this point. So we let's just be see, honest about what this is. Exactly. We have to see the regime in Kiev as being essentially an extension, almost a puppet regime of the US State Department. We it, we literally have to see it in that frame. That, that is almost a, a truism of this entire conflict. That's certainly right. how I see it. And, so, and just on that point about, sorry, Charlie, just on that point about negotiations very quickly, um, whenever there's a setback in Ukraine for the Ukrainians or for the West, I'll always say, you know, the, this idea of, of um, 
you know, like, oh, the, there might need to be a ceasefire or that, you know, Russia's mobilized 3, 000, 3, you know, 300,000 men. And, you know, the, U, the US, you know, Blinken is pressuring Z Zelensky to, to sign a ceasefire. Now, if you were the, you know, if you were Putin and Shoigu and, you know, the, the commanders and the military and political leaders of Russia, why would you? You know, if you've got to the point where you are now mobilizing troops and you're bringing to bear the full force of your army, why would you negotiate with the very same creatures who have admitted to acting in bad faith prior? It is actually the the designers of Minsk and those who admitted to Minsk being a, a time buying exercise, right? A, a cynical time buying exercise. Why would the Russians now agree with either those people or the successes of those people to sign a disadvantageous peace? You know, like at this point. It's going to be a case of if you or I or anyone like in our proximity were, you know, if we're going to play armchair general and pretend that we're Putin for five minutes, why would you negotiate? Why would you sign? Exactly. A, like, now that you've mobilized and you're, you know, this thing is in train, right? Why would you? In the end, the Russians are now backed in a corner where they have to fulfill as many victory conditions as possible before this war ends. That's it. That's the only consideration, the considerations the Russians have from a standpoint of grand strategy. And Western media, you know, people and people who watch the media exclusively do not accept that fundamental truth. Sorry, I know that's a bit of a digression, but I thought it was, thought it was important. No, that's that's good because again, I wanted to really highlight the importance of what was done before the war, like negotiating with other great powers like Russia, especially in bad faith utterly destroys any possibility of negotiation and and so now there's no there's no way to end this war other than the total collapse of one side or the other which is not a situation uh you want to be in so what i have here is an article there's this organization called osce uh which basically tracked since the minsker agreements were signed they tracked a number of violations of that ceasefire and you can see here these dates uh this is before the war actually started um, this is actually when President oh, Biden just before, was saying, actually, that's like a, a few days before the war actually broke out. Uh, precisely. Um, yeah. And I'll show yeah. you more on this later. Sure, uh, sure. But but you can see here this title, um, you know, ceasefire violations, because one of the things that's been happening in the Donbass is for the past eight years, the Ukrainians just uh, fire shells into the cities, basically. Uh, literally, that's not an exaggeration. Uh, they do a few a day, basically. Uh, years and that, that's resulted uh when you combine that with the deaths in the civil war uh, in 2014 um at least 14,000 people died um as of you know february 19th 2022 um and, and this is really why i want to point out that the west does not have the moral high ground here um because the ukrainians have been shelling effectively their own people uh, literally randomly for for almost a decade now and they're still doing this to this day right they launch random explosives just into cities not in a military capacity right not to like uh destroy some you know ammunition depot uh but just just randomly um and i'm, I'm not making that up that sounds crazy but that's what they've been doing for the last eight years um hopefully people have been aware of that and if they haven't well now you are uh, and th this is sort of the issue right i mean in terms of the rights to rule a place right i mean i don't really want to get into that so much uh, you, obviously the there are there are people who can rightly be called Ukrainians and they have a right to self-government, you know, whatever that means in whatever geographic area they're in. Uh, but you also have to be able to control your geographic areas. And look, if these territories separated, you can't just shell them for eight years straight. I mean, you, you basically demonstrated at this point that they're no longer part of your country. And you, how, how can you have any right to rule these people that you're bombing? Not to mention the fact that they clearly do not want to be a part of ukraine anymore you know they had these referendums people will say these referendums were fake oh you know uh the russians just cheated but look i mean how would you vote if you were shelled for eight years straight would you want to be part Correct. of that country anymore L i don't L let's, think so <laughs> exactly let's let's clear to this one fact that uprisings don't materialize out the ether and for no good purpose if ethnic and linguistic russians in the in the donbass wanted no part of what had occurred or, or of what was occurring in kiev and the direction in which shall i say the greater part of ukraine proper was going there's no it, it, there's no um ambiguity as to why the more russian speaking and the more genuinely ethnic parts of ukraine would not want to go in the same direction as the rest of the country because essentially sort of 
you know how so they sort of say like you know the united states is two countries it's the liberal coast and red the red interior kind of thing ukraine is is similar in that sense that you have this sort of russian sort of north east east and southeast portion and then this different core of the country that is what you would, might, might call ukrainian per se Actually, this map demonstrates it quite neatly um and they are essentially sort of two countries compressed into one you know brought about by a, a broad geographic cultural identity that sort of melds them into the one thing um but as you might say you've had this more western oriented half of ukraine that looks towards the eu that looks towards nature that looks towards you know the american empire and you know western culture there is this eastern part that is looking more towards moscow that is is more connected to russia and these two sides of ukraine have been diverging and doing so at a more rapid rate of pace in the last 10 years to the point where there is there has been literally an uprising in the donbass and has been going on since 2014 15 and there is not a genuine and shall i say an intellectually honest discussion about that point no and obviously people don't just uh you know form militias and attempt to secede from a a sovereign country on a on a for nothing right i mean these people had serious reason to want to do that and succeeded at it it would be different if Ukraine had, you know, put down the revolution in 2014, maintained their sovereignty in their entirety, and, you know, then Russia invades eight years later. We'd be talking about something different. But the fact is they lost control of their territory, and that's it. Look, you can't you can't just bomb people for eight years randomly. Uh, that's not okay, and our country shouldn't be supporting the side uh, that did that. Um, obviously, Russia also has serious geopolitical interests in taking control of these territories. I don't want to sit here and pretend like Russia is some sort of like fairy tale, lovely land where they're just really nice and they just love their fellow co-ethnic so much that, you know, they're going to go in and spend spill their blood for them. I mean, that could be true, too, but they have serious geopolitical interests in this region. And frankly, it would have been better yeah, for the there, West. There's, 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 there's both economic and military necessity for them doing this, if you might put it that way. Right. And Russia is actually going to be in a much stronger position when this war is over. Um, and they control the these areas along the Black Sea and have access to the oil reserves there. It would have been better if the main agreements are followed and these territories were not annexed by Russia. So the, the West is actually going to end up in a worse strategic position um, because of what it did. Um, so th there's really no way to look at this that makes any sense from the Western point of view. I mean, obviously it's a, it's a, the war is, is somewhat cheap in terms of the material being sent, but anyway, I don't want to get too much, too far off the point here. Um, so, you know, this area has seceded, uh, it's been bombed. Um, these reports before the war actually started on the, where's my blog I had up right here. So I just read this book. Um, by a fellow that I would actually like to talk to um, in a subsequent stream, maybe on Semiagog's channel, actually. Uh, but he has this uh, handy little chart in his book that compiles the ceasefire violations. So as you can see on the left, on February 14th of last year, um, they were shelling at a you know fairly large rate, but not incredibly high. Um, basically, every day looked like this bar or, or less, uh, right? So Ukraine just consistently shelled um the regions of donetsk and lugansk um continuously but at a very low volume and then suddenly and, and, and it looks like a few dozen shells a day for a very long time essentially is what you're saying you know because that, yeah, that's so what that every, maybe, yeah obviously i haven't looked at every single day some days yeah. i'm sure there were no shells uh some days it oscillate sure were... around a rough number that right be low. but it, it was yeah. it was more or less continuous uh yeah. but then you yeah, can yeah. see a few days before the war actually started when biden was announcing that russia was going to attack this is the key part of the, the of the story. Ukraine is the country that started the war. Uh, they ramped up the shelling. You can see starting maybe on the 16th or 17th, especially uh, to hundreds of shells per day. Um, we saw in that article it said 1,500, and by the 18th, uh, they were shelling more. They were launching more than a thousand artillery rounds into the next, the next, sorry, Donetsk and Lugansk per day, right? And if you compile the month of February, you have like 10,000 rounds of artillery artillery i'm sure um or at least uh i don't know what do we have here real quick it looks like about five thousand in the week before uh, the war started uh, so I mean, from the 14th <laughs> who we, started the 14th, this war <laughs> well, well from the 14th to the 18th you're seeing over a tenfold increase in the number of shells being fired into donetsk city right into the donbass 
uh, that's that's not to be ignored. That's an extremely uh, aggressive expansion. Far more of, than ten. Of, of, I was going to say, yeah, even, I'm, I'm being I'm being modest, but you know, a, a, easily like a twenty fold increase in in the amount of um, munitions being sent against what is essentially a civilian city. Yeah. And sustained, right? Um, and sustained. So, what is this? This is the precursor to an invasion, basically. Um, that's what this is. Uh, it's it's no secret that Ukraine was building up their military. In my blog here, I have this other handy little graph uh, that I parsed out from another uh, report. But basically, ever since the coup uh, back in 2014, Ukraine's been increasing its military budget for the express purpose of uh, invading uh, Donbass. And it's even part of their <laughs> constitution to retake Crimea. So it's not like there, there's going to be a war. Uh, either way, either Ukraine was going to invade the Donbass, uh, and then they would they would unleash their, you know, Azov and right sector and other nationalist, uh, quote unquote nationalist uh, troops upon these citizens and inflict you know horrors they're, they're, upon they're, them, they're which they've done. Battalions, as, as we could call them. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean these <laughs> the Ukrainians get up to some nasty stuff. We'll say um, if you look in the history of the 20th century. Um, some of the most heinous stuff I've ever seen was done by um, the um, the OUN, what, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists and the, the Banderites, right? Uh, that's that's part of what uh, Bandera's group was about. Uh, I'm, I'm talking like what they did is more like the Japanese than anyone else, right? During World War II. It's, it's really heinous stuff. And they still mm -hmm. do this sort of thing today in the uh, Azov and right sector battalions and the National Guard and these other parts, these other militias that have actually now been incorporated in the Ukrainian military. Um, they, they will torture civilians. Uh, they will find you if you supported Russia uh, and, um, you know, tor torture you. I mean, it's there's no other way to say it, right? These are not nice people. So Ukraine was not just going to walk into the Donbass and just be very polite and, and take the place back. No, they were going to inflict um, tremendous horrors on top on these people, on top of the fact that they were already shelling them, right? A hundred thousand Ukrainians fled to the east, uh, to Russia, actually, um, when the shelling um, happened. Uh, I, I mean, okay, so this guy in chat here, we'll just bring this up. He asked if I have any evidence. I mean, this is an international organization. This isn't like the OSCE, you can go look at their reports. This isn't like Russian propaganda, right? I mean, this happened, it's acknowledged, um, so we'll put that aside. But I just I want to point that out, that this is real, real internationally verified information. It's not some sort of secret or, or anything like that. Um, and yeah, this guy, uh, we'll bring him up real quick as well, because this is important. Um, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not an expert on the history of this area of the world, but I have done some readings since the war started, and... Yeah, wow. It's it's you. You would think the Ukrainians are like the Japanese from World War Two. Um, not all of them, obviously. Yes. I'm talking about the, the OUN and the Banderites. It's, it, it's, it's just probably, yeah, it could be defined as in so far that some of these, uh, some of these, the um, the people who take it to, to the logical extension of their ideology um, have a, have a a profound sadistic streak inside of them, shall we say? Like to put it politely, you know. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, okay. So that that needs to be said that. There was no option here where there was not going to be a war where uh, the civilians here suffered, right? So from Russia's perspective, um, you either let that happen or you, uh, you could say, preemptively attack, uh, arguably counterattack. Uh, so, so that's how uh, the American president, Joe Biden, knew that the Russians were going to invade um, was because... Uh, the Russians were put in a situation where the only logical thing to do at that point from their perspective was to invade uh, this part of the Donbass to prevent the mass murder of the civilians there. And at the same time, be able to claim the moral high ground and achieve geopolitical objectives, right? Obviously, they have geopolitical objectives here. Um, and they were given the casus belli to do that because of the Ukrainians, right? As I was saying... Russia would not control this territory if the Minsk agreements um, had just been adhered to. But instead, we've handed Russia the moral high ground on a silver platter uh, through supporting what the Ukrainian government has been doing for the past eight years, nine years now, and what NATO is doing. Uh, so that, that's just where we are. Um, NATO doesn't have the moral high ground or the Americans or the Ukrainians uh, in this situation. Um, and that's why I oppose the war. Um, 
obviously the Ukrainian government is simply uh, the is simply a an evil puppet of the American regime. Um, these people in the Donbass should simply be allowed to achieve their self determination as they see fit. If that means joining Russia, so be it. Uh, does that put the U- Russia in a stronger position and the United States in a weaker one? Yes, but look. We that shall we? Into the uh, step of Asia, right? Um, okay. Sorry, we just so, lost you for a sec there, Charlie. Right. Uh, well, do you have anything you want to add there? Um, uh, no, I think I think what you might have said is mostly you know true, and I don't really have a lot to um to to say in that regard. It's just that I have to say I'm I'm smirking a little bit because there's a few people who've wandered in and you know oh how to be a Russian puppet 101. It's just like no. You know, and and I'll, I'll, I'll well, reiterate. This is, this is why this issue is important. Um, exactly. Yeah. The, this isn't about. This isn't like a culture war game. It's not about is Russia based or something, or do I support Russia? It's it's simply about having the capability to analyze this war from the correct moral dimension. I mean, people love to do this mm-hmm. with like World War Two, right? Both of us do. But I want to take that and apply it to something that's actually happening now and maybe something mm-hmm. that we can help put an end to, right? It's, exactly. I think it's very important to have a proper moral understanding of what is happening here um, as mm. right-wingers and as Christians. Um, the, so, yeah, the, go ahead. The, uh, yeah, and, and exactly. And the thing, too, is to – I mean, I, I – I know you and I slightly diverge here. I mean, I know we mostly agree, but there's a slight divergence of, I do think the considerations which you have raised have a primacy and are probably the most important considerations. And although I do think that there's a matter of prioritization between the geopolitical and the, like the grand strategic and the, the cultural stuff, I, w- I will say so far that um, our elites would love nothing more than to tear Russia asunder and see the transformation occurring in Russia as a, a, like an attack against what the regime is doing within our countries and how, you know, it's like, Oh, you know, they would lo- put this way. They'd love a chance to pause Russia in the same way they're pausing us. And, and just on that point as well, is that, you know, we have to see the most important thing. And I, and I sort of started, I suppose I started, you know, when we began this video, this was my starting point was that, you know, our, our elites are hostile elites for a reason. You know, they, they have done everything <clears throat> within their power to make our lives difficult, to make our lives, um, it's diminish us and the culture around us and the nations that we, you know, the, the, we are the kind of people who, who are homesick for a place that no longer exists. Our elites have done that. So if they have engaged with that kind of malfeasance in our own societies, are these people going to be saints when um engaging with other countries when being involved with the affairs of other political and geo you know, geopolitical and and strategic spheres no they're not because these are also the people who are responsible for the death of uh, and the sufferance of millions of people in iraq of probably now millions of syrians they have destroyed um they have destroyed libya you know at the moment yemen is gripped by a famine and a civil war they tore yugoslavia asunder you know like how how much more proof do people need that our elites are responsible for these things and they don't do it out of love or kind of like bleeding heart liberal sense of justice they are monsters and we must see it for what it is right that's where this gets weird is i notice uh, a lot of people just have this weird like hate boner i guess you could say for russia or sort of view russia as this like joke country that's super corrupt and just incompetent Mm. and just sort of i don't know i don't know what it where it comes from but this Mm. war needs to be understood Mm. in the context Mm. of the war in yugoslavia Mm. and libya and iraq and syria and now in ukraine Mm. the same thing it's not like it, it would be different if the united states was some sort of um you know <laughs> extremely moral uh christian empire uh right but that's not what it is it's mm. it's 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 one of the most evil countries on the planet um and mm. it is attempting to spread uh satanic de- de- degeneracy across the planet right mm. that's what they have in store for russia and in fact they want it, to tear it's, the it's russian their vocation apart. It's, their, it's their mission right they've admitted yes. to it as much yes they want to yeah pause the world they want to annihilate the russian uh culture and replace it with this um international uh liberalism to put it bluntly i would just say yes. bolshevism really um yes 
so that's the situation we're in, right? Where mm -hmm. we have to understand that. I mean, again, I don't. Yeah, we lost you again, Charlie. This is an existential. Th this is a globalist war um, against mm. one of the last uh, states that's attempting to stand in the way of mm. uh, this agenda. And obviously, mm. Russia is significantly um, mm. debased, especially from communism, just like the West is. I don't, I don't have any illusions about like you know the state of the Russian country, right? Uh, but it's not on board with this. Uh, globalist agenda which is the number one thing we must oppose in the world at this moment because this, this, yeah. this is an all or nothing game um well it, let's face it both sides it can be it can be said quite confidently that both sides have um thrown most of their chips into the pot to use a gambling analogy um but but this conversation has taken an interesting turn and I, and just because we've mentioned russia i i if you get, if i may just have a couple of minutes charlie i've there's a couple of points i want to make about russia specifically that i think because you said like you mentioned something along the lines of oh people have this interpretation of russia or there's this sort of boogeyman complex with russia and i just want to touch on like a couple of things because i think it's important understanding why westerners have this perception and um if i may just a couple of minutes yeah Charlie. no go ahead firstly firstly um russia has almost always been at the beck and call of um of of the west to deal with its problems um in terms of the russians took the brunt of napoleon's grand army in 1812 and you know helped and fought in many coalition war against the coalition wars against napoleon and the revolutionary forces and then in 1848 um the russians again are, are responsible for having uh, quelled the instability in europe when they had the great upset of 1848 right and then in the face of the burgeoning German Empire, which, let's face it, if things had gone differently, the 20th century would have been the German century and not the Anglo-American century. It's Russia that takes the brunt of the eastern armies of, of Austria, Hungary and Germany. And then in World War II, even though under Soviet guys, but let's face it, and I think people like you and I get this, that like it's Soviet Bolshevism and what we call the GAE are different expressions of, of revolutionary politics, right? But the fact is that the what you know the the soviets take the absolute brunt of the wehrmacht and they to quote churchill they tear the guts out of the german army and they do albeit with a whole uh, with a mass um with an abundance of lend lease or european lend lease from britain and america that make it possible um so russia has done the, the legwork and has taken the 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 body blows for the this international liberal order that we now face right but inversely, when Russia didn't play ball, you know, they were, the British and the, the French were happy to engage in the Crimean War. They're happy to isolate Russia. They see Russia, you know, under, the, especially in the Tsarist guys, as this, as this bastion against the revolution, as this bastion of, of sort of, you know, reactionary, authoritarian, you know, a, a backwardness, shall I say, when compared to sort of the, the parliamentarian liberal West um and and another small amount of framing i want to touch on is that um and i and i call it the zolzhenitsyn distinction i've started using this term because you know zolzhenitsyn fairly says that the first and the primary victims of the bolshevik revolution were ethnic russians they attacked the russian orthodox church they attacked russian cossacks they attacked russian kulaks they took away their property and their and i hate to use this term because i know it's pretty pretty nebulous nowadays but they deprive the russians of their right to be russian and to be members of their class or their communities right the bolsheviks you know diced up and parceled russian land and gave it to their party apparatchiks right and the soviet regime you know the again the first victims of that regime were russians and so i think you know, the, at, the, at the end of 1945, when we have the defeat of the Axis forces, you know, there's a defeat of, of, of the Third Reich and of, you know, fascist Italy and Imperial Japan. Obviously, we moved from World War II to Cold War, and there needs to be another enemy, another demon in the, in the psychology of the West. And even though they had used 
the Soviet Union and before that Russia as this meat grinder for their for their purposes to defeat their other continental enemies. The the Soviets become this boogeyman in the Cold War. And this is why, I mean, sometimes I even make this mistake myself, but I try to stop myself from doing it. I do not use the words Soviet and Russia interchangeably because Correct, you know, yeah. the, the, the Soviets are the regime which was imposed on Russia by the Bolsheviks, which is a whole other can of worms. And we know who's responsible for the Bolshevik revolution. Let's put a bookmark in it and close it because we know what we're talking about without elaborating. But for for the Western narrative, this idea and and it's something that's really I think affected boomer mentality, right? Is that for them, Russia, Soviet, Russia, Bolshevik, communism are the same thing, but they are not. They need to be seen as dis distinct things. And the, the the circle of the Cold War, and then we see with like you know Fukuyama's end of history when the war falls in the early nineties, right? And the 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 final victory, you might say, the Enzig of um of liberal democracy and capitalism in the nineties. Um, you know, Russia's kind of seen as this. Oh well, the Soviet system ran out of ran out of you know steam and it collapsed because it was crap, and the Russian people just left to pick up the pieces. Um, and so you know I, i'm sorry this is a bit of a digression but i really really think it's important because i think a lot of people in our circles and particularly people who are older than us use russia soviet interchangeably and it's not true moreover we have to identify the fact that historically the you know london washington etc have used russia because they can they can send men flesh into the meat grinder you know russia's this big relatively populous country that sits on the border of Poland, of Germany, of, you know, prior to the Austria, the, uh, the, um, the Austrian empire and the Ottoman empire. Right. So the West can, you know, do these naval landings and can, you know, can, can, can invade Mesopotamia. They can invade Palestine from Egypt and, you know, they can land at Anzio and Salerno and, you know, do their little things, but it's the Russians that do the lead work and they, and they absorb the big body blows on the continent in, in a military context. So the Russians are useful for that, but then when their usefulness is 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 over, it's when the usefulness has you know elapsed, then Russia becomes the convenient boogeyman, and people really need to see that for what it is, because it is deeply cynical and it is actually immoral. Sorry, that was a bit of a tangent, but it's really important we canvass it, Charlie. No, that was very good. Um, so where to go from there? What I want to Sorry, that let, was let me say <laughs> not, no, no, it was good. I'm just trying to formulate what I uh, had in my head. So, you know, again, in ter in terms of the war, right? I mean, uh, uh, we can say that uh, President Putin. I would. Twenty fourteen, he annexed mm -hmm. Crimea, and frankly, Russia could have absolutely rolled the Ukrainian military back in 2014 if they had chosen to intervene. They chose not to. Um, they The Donbass, the two republics, only existed up until 2022 because the Russians finally did uh, come in at the last minute and actually prevent the Ukrainian military from annihilating them. Um, so, you know, they had opportunities to, to be much more aggressive here, and they didn't. Now, of course... Mr. Putin did ultimately decide to escalate this war, right? He made the decision to go into Ukraine. Um, it looks like a war was going to happen either way. Um, whether or not that was the right move, uh, frankly, that's between him and God, okay? But from my view, it's it's clear that the American NATO side threw away the moral high ground a long time ago. Um, so any condemnation you want to put on Mr. Putin for escalating the war uh, can certainly be put on our side as well and frankly our side could unilaterally end the war at any time um and it should because it's simply not right to be causing the immense amount of uh suffering that's going on in ukraine to to absolutely no end at this point 